Hamas's head fake hostage deal or holy war for the month of Ramadan? Join us. Khaled Abotwame, my dear friend, colleague of many, many years, we have a watershed situation right now. Many people in the West are unaware of Yahya Sinwar, the Hamas leader, deep underground, but strategizing and executing what could be a D-Day scenario for the Middle East, igniting an Islamic war across the region. And it reminds us, Khaled, of what Arafat did in the second intifada in 2000 in the al-aqsa intifada then uh, yahya sinwar and the leadership of the tunnels as the palestinians call them the hamas leader leadership of the tunnels how do you say it in arabic uh al anfaq ah they are in they're not in a rush to achieve any deal because they know the that the uh, holy month of ramadan is uh, approaching its uh, next week and their hope is that during Ramadan, the Muslims in Israel, the Muslims in the West Bank, and the Muslims in the Middle East and elsewhere will join the so-called Al-Aqsa flood and erupt against Israel. This is their hope, by the way. Uh, as you said, I mean, Sinwar is on the run. He's in the tunnels. But he is not in a rush because uh, he doesn't feel the heat. He's not... He and the the Tal leadership uh, are probably hiding in Rafah right now, as we hear, and they're surrounded by the hostages. Uh, and their strategy, of course, is survival. And from day one, they've been betting on what they call the unity of the battlefields. What does that mean? We, Hamas, launched this attack on Israel, and then Hezbollah uh, and all the other Iran proxies will join us. Uh, and the West Bank will erupt against Israel, and so will the Arabs inside Israel. So far, they have not achieved that goal. I mean, what we have with Hezbollah is not what Hamas was really hoping for. Uh, Sinwar and company were hoping for an all-out war. They were hoping that Hezbollah would seize the opportunity and launch a comprehensive in, uh, attack on Israel. That hasn't happened yet. So they are disappointed. And now, as I said, they're hoping that Ramadan will provide them with the uh, excuse to ignite the situation. Uh, they want, uh, you know, an intifada in the West Bank. They want to see Arabs inside Israel repeat the events of uh, May 2021. And that, that, that hasn't happened yet. So let's wait and see what happens. But you know, Khaled, this reminds me of what Yasser Arafat tried to do after the, the late 1990s, his strategy as chairman of the PLO, chairman of the Fatah, and chairman of the Palestinian Authority was to ignite the entire Arab world, including the Arab-Israeli community. And we remember how that back in the October riots of October 2000 inside Israel, a limited uh, but two weeks of riots uh, that that uh, Arafat sought to ignite the entire region and come out at Salah Adin. Now, it looks like Sinwar picked up where Arafat left off, and I would suggest that Sinwar perceptually has succeeded to a large extent, even now because he is perceived as sort of an Islamic hero, underground, but very much holding off what they look at as the, you know, the Zionist invaders. And, and in fact, here they are head faking the hostage deal, getting the United States to pressure Israel as well as the Western European powers led by the United Kingdom. And at the same time, he, there he is igniting, uh, you know, in his view, the Arab world. The question I have is how successful can he be in igniting the Arab Muslim street across the region? Well, if that hasn't happened over the past uh, 150 days, Dan, I'm, I'm ready to take a risk and say that it's highly unlikely 
to happen. Because we have not seen demonstrations across the Middle East. We've seen it across the Midwest and in the and in the East Coast of the United States, but not across the Middle East uh, 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 on the map. Ironically, I mean, we see more uh, anti-Israel demonstrations and protests in the West than we do see in Arab capitals or even in the West Bank, by the way, uh, or in uh, other Arab countries or Islamic countries. Now, you talked about the Palestinian or the PLO strategy, Yasser Arafat strategy. It's not only Yasser Arafat strategy, it's a, it's a comprehensive Palestinian strategy that has always been there. It's a long time strategy that the Palestinians have devised, which says we want uh, to drag the Arabs and the Muslims into this conflict with Israel. And I remember during the first intifada that erupted in 1987, Palestinians were pinning high hopes on the Arabs and the Muslims to come to the rescue. It didn't happen. And it started in Gaza over a, over a traffic accident. Yes, over rumors uh, that, you know, it was uh, six Palestinian laborers were killed. And uh, the rumor was that uh, this was an intentional uh, car accident, that the, uh, dr that the Jewish driver was a brother of an uh, Israeli soldier who was killed by Palestinians and all that. But anyway... During the first intifada, that did not happen. So the Palestinians were very disappointed with the inaction, with the failure of the Arabs and the Muslims to get involved. I remember during the second intifada, Yasser Arafat tried to rally the Arabs and the Muslims against Israel by accusing Israel of having plans to demolish the Al-Aqsa Mosque. You know, he sees the uh, Sharon, the Ariel Sharon visit to incite the people uh, around the world, uh, the Arabs and the Muslims, uh, to, uh, because Arafat saw himself as the Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, as the great Muslim warrior who is here to liberate the, uh, the holy sites from the, uh, from the invaders, from the, from the non-Muslims. And he liked that comparison between him and uh, Salah al-Din, uh, the, the great Muslim warrior who drove the crusaders out. Now, the Arabs and the Muslims again failed the Palestinians, by the way, during the Second Intifada. I mean, we, okay, we had a, a number of protests uh, and demonstrations in the Arab world, but the Arabs and the Muslims did not feel that Al-Aqsa was really in danger to a point that they had to send armies and uh, uh, volunteers uh, to attack Israel. That did not happen. Now, the thing is that the you know, the Palestinian leadership, whether it's a PLO or Hamas, they do not learn from their mistakes. They do not learn from previous uh, experiences with the Arabs and the Muslims that the Arabs and the Muslims actually don't really care about them. They give them lip service. But at the end of the day, Egypt is not going to send the army to attack Israel. And the Jordan is not going to send uh, its troops to uh, liberate Jerusalem or uh, defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, as the Palestinians are demanding. So I say it's time for Palestinian leadership to wake up and stop this uh, attempt to drag uh, the Arabs uh, and the Muslims into a clash with Israel. It's not working. It's, it's not working. It's not working on a regional level or even on a, let's call it a cross or an intra-Arab Islamic or Muslim level, religious level. But where I think it is working, Khalid, is on a more local Palestinian level. If you look at Yahya Sinwar, has succeeded in co-opting the Arab Palestinian, the Palestinian street. Now, there's this is where the West is mistaken. I think that President Biden, with um, you know all of his uh, uh, historic support for Israel and military support for, to help Israel defend itself, he and 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 my former classmate Tony Blinken, my university classmate Tony Blinken, misunderstand one key point. And that is the Palestinian street today is being commanded, ruled, and led by Yahya Sinwar, not Mahmoud Abbas. Yes, uh, undoubtedly, uh, Dan, Yahya Sinwar is now the leader of the Palestinians. He is the hero. Why? Because like Saddam Hussein and like Hassan Nasrallah and like other Arab leaders, this is a, a great Muslim warrior who managed to inflict pain on Israel who invaded Israel, who masterminded one of the most uh, uh, comprehensive attacks against Israel. So yes, he has core points with the Palestinian street. There is no doubt about it. 
And many of these people who support Sinwar, it's not out of love for Sinwar as much as it's out of hate for Israel. Uh, they want to see Israel hurt. Uh, I remember uh, during the first Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein was firing uh, rockets at Israel, we saw Palestinians celebrating on, on, on the streets. Uh, I covered these uh, celebrations in the West Bank and even in East Jerusalem. Uh, and Saddam Hussein became the hero of the Arab masses, uh, of the Palestinians uh, specifically. Uh, and then when Hezbollah uh, did the same thing and they fired rockets at Israel, Hassan Nasrallah became the, uh, the, the hero. Uh, and this re keeps repeating itself. Uh, and that's why uh, as long as Yahya Sinwar is around and as long as he uh, manages to escape, you know, or evade arrest or death, he will continue to, uh, um, I would say, occupy the hearts of many Palestinians. And that's very dangerous, by the way. Men, the Islamists among the Palestinians and the extremists have been emboldened by October 7. Yeah, very much so. In fact, and this is why... Uh is the point that uh, uh, Arya Lightstone, uh, the former uh, senior advisor to Ambassador David Friedman of the United States to Israel, and I spoke on um, uh, ILTV and made this particular uh, and made this particular point. The danger here, Khaled, is that the uh, the U.S. administration either fails to understand or chooses not to see that it's pressuring Israel now to towards a ceasefire. They're pressuring Israel now to stop the war. They're pressuring Israel now to, to make some sort of a uh, hostage compromise is actually emboldening, emboldening Sinwar, emboldening Iranian regime and all of its proxies, weakening the United States and placing Israel in existential danger. Then one of the reasons why Hamas is refusing to uh, display flexibility in the negotiations over the release of the hostages and a ceasefire is because they are convinced that as we approach, as we get near to the elections in the U.S., pressure or U.S. pressure on Israel will grow. And they listen very carefully to what President Biden is saying. They listen very carefully to what Vice President uh, Kamala, Ka Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, Harris is saying. And they're saying, oh, oh, it's working. The, the pressure on Israel is growing. We're beginning to hear a, a new voices or a new tone coming from the Americans. And they're saying, why rush? We'll wait for another week, two, three. And, you know, American pressure could stop this war and save Hamas. It's, it, it stopped the war, save Hamas, and enable, empower, and fuel the Iranian regime's race to the nuclear finish line. That is, right? That's the, isn't that the irony that here is the United States doing everything it can to prevent Iran from attaining nuclear weapons, and what they're doing is speeding up Iran's race. They're fueling Iran's, uh, um, uh, you know, 100-yard uh, dash to that nuclear finish line. Because Iran is the elephant in the room. and Or the octopus in the room. The octopus, <laughs> yes. Uh, we all know that uh, this is an indirect war between Israel and Iran because Iran's proxies are attacking Israel on a number of fronts. Uh, and if you don't deal with Iran, you know, uh, you're, you're not going to stop the proxies, the Houthis, uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah. And there is a feeling that the U.S. administration is not putting enough pressure on the Iranian regime to stop, you know, or to uh, to rein in or control its proxies in the Middle East. And as long as that's not happening, you know, the the, uh, the conflict will continue. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, I think it not only is continuing, it's intensifying yeah. to degrees that we haven't uh, seen before. I, I, I think that it's, it's still been unreported in the West, the degree of, uh, bar of, of bar barbarism and seriousness and a strategic and even existential danger the October 7th atrocities have placed uh, have placed uh, Israel in. You know, we look at the, uh, as Sinwar is looking to ignite uh, the Middle East and is really becoming a, um, a well-respected uh, ally of the Iranian, of the mullahs and the IRGC, uh, we see in the, you know, in the North is a very serious uh, 
development where it by which the uh, Iranian regime, as we understand it from former Mossad officials that work with the JCPA, who we cannot name in the in the podcast for security reasons, but they said in an internal discussion uh, two days ago that we were both part of, um, that it's in the Iranian regime's interest right now to uh, to ratchet up the heat on the northern border. And, and, and this is a very dangerous game because, you know, wars start can start small but get can uh, get out of control immediately with the miscalculations. We saw this last night, Dan, uh, when they uh, fired more than 30 uh, rockets uh, into Kiryachmon and uh, other communities along the border with Israel. Uh, so you're absolutely right. I mean, all roads lead to Iran, and Iran is interested in keeping the flames, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very high. Uh, and they're not going to order their proxies in Gaza or their proxies in Lebanon to stop uh, or to uh, reduce their their attacks on Israel unless there is pressure on them. And they don't feel the pressure. The mullahs in, in Tehran do not feel any pressure. And they're, they're not in a rush, by the way. They have all the time. You know, Iran itself is not under attack. Uh, it's it's proxies, you know, playing around in the Middle East, and as long as it doesn't directly affect the, the mullahs in Iran, they're they're fine with it. How much influence uh, does the underlying bubbling, um, fifteen sixteen hundred year old war between Shia and Sunni play into the relative uh, lack of massive demonstrations across the Middle East? Because let's say the Middle East is eighty five percent Sunni. And and there's been and, and Palestinians are 100 percent Sunni, 100 percent Sunni, and 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 you know they have no love. If you get into a, a conversation with any uh, you know r- any sort of everyday Palestinian, you start talking about the Shia, that you will not hear something that's particularly endearing, uh, but but rather they they look at it uh, w- w- not you know in the most favorable eyes. You know, Dan, I once asked a Hamas official in the days when we used to go to Gaza, why are you aligned with Iran? I mean, you are Sunni and they are Shia, and uh, the Shiites are uh, battling the the Sunnis, and uh, there's a conflict going on. And he said, look, there is no love between us. And uh, we are very suspicious of them, and they are very suspicious of us, but we have a common enemy over here uh, called Israel. And if these guys want to give us weapons and money, why not? We'll take them. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we favor Iran or that we are ready to sac- make sacrifices for these Shiites. Uh, at one point, by the way, in the Gaza Strip, I remember, if you wanted to insult a Palestinian, uh, you would call him a Shiite. That was considered an insult. And Hamas, by the way, has been accused of trying to introduce Shia into Palestinian society. It's very interesting. There were, fo- there were pictures in 2018 just to put an exclamation point on your observation here, there were pictures of Ali Khamenei in Gaza and Qasem Soleimani in Gaza. And you began to see, wait a second, what's going on in 100% Sunni Gaza uh, where you have pictures of the Iranian regime leadership uh, in in, uh, the major cities in Gaza? The same thing, by the way, happened with Qasem Soleimani after he was uh, assassinated. Uh, by the Americans in Iraq, suddenly you saw pictures of uh, Qasem Soleimani popping up in different places, and Palestinians who dared to tear down these uh, photos and big billboards uh, praising Qasem Soleimani were arrested by Hamas. Uh, so, you know, yes, there is a there is no love between Sunnis and Shias, but we see now that they have decided to put aside their conflict and all their differences, and they are all united uh, against Israel, against the Americans, and uh, against uh, uh, what they perceive to be, you know, a failed Arab dictatorships and uh, uh, with a U.S. allied or Western allied Arab regimes. You know, when we when we uh, think about the potential Ramadan earthquake uh, that could take place here, uh, there are assessments by uh, Israeli security officials and, and intelligence officials that uh, have spent a lot of time in uh, between Rafah and Khan Yunus right now in trying to understand where uh, Yahya Sinwar is. And they, we think we know exactly where he is. Uh, 
the tactical situation is very difficult, but from an intelligence and cultural standpoint, it really raises the very practical issue of what to do in the uh, Muslim compounds in Jerusalem, because uh, there, you know, Ramadan is a is a, is a special holiday for uh, for Islam, and there are tens of thousands of Muslims that come to worship in the Al Aqsa Mosque, and the vast majority of them are peaceful people who just want to come and worship. But there is, there, as we have seen done in previous years, there is always this minority that is willing to, or that is trying to drag uh, the Muslims into a clash with the Israel security forces at the uh, Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque compound. Um, and we've seen over the uh, the past years attempts to, or not even attempts, uh, actually uh, we've seen uh, these so-called protesters uh, raise Hamas flags. We've seen them chant slogans in support of Muhammad Deif and Yahya Sinwar and the armed uh, wing of Hamas. Uh, by the way, much to the dismay of many worshippers over there who did not like that, who said, you know, we came here to pray. What are you doing? Why are you using the mosque uh, to uh, express support for a political faction? This is not the right place. Uh, and you know, Dan, it's not only Hamas supporters who were using it, even supporters of the Palestinian Authority and Fatah uh, also tried to turn the, uh, the, the Friday prayers or the Ramadan prayers at the uh, mosque into a political a uh, display of support for Abu Mazen and the the Fatah, and this is something that most uh, you know worshippers who come uh, to Jerusalem and to the uh, era, to the holy sites are opposed to. Uh, these are most of them, by the way, are Arab um, Israelis, uh, Muslims from inside Israel. Is that the majority, by the way, of their what fifty or sixty or eighty or not, even a hundred thousand worshippers come? Correct. Yes, I mean, the, the, these are the estimates. I mean, uh, from inside Israel, uh, from the Arab community inside Israel, we have like 100 to 120,000 uh, Muslims coming uh, every Friday of Ramadan to the uh, mosque. But And let's not forget that in, in recent years, uh, Israel has been allow, allowing hundreds of thousands of Muslims from the West Bank to come into uh, Jerusalem. At one point, according to Waqf officials uh, in Jerusalem, uh, the number of people who prayed at the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Friday during Ramadan was 400,000, wow. not more, people. And uh, let's see how this is going to play out. I mean, Ram Ramadan starts next Monday. And uh, the Israeli government did something good. It announced that there will be no restrictions on the Arab citizens of Israel who want to come. And this is a very good point, a very good development. That was Prime Minister Netanyahu yes. said on them, by the way. Yes, uh, in, in consultation, or he accepted the recommendation of the Israeli security forces. Uh, and this is a, a positive development that will ease tensions and uh, uh, deny the extremists the opportunity to drag the Arabs inside Israel into a clash with Israel. So even in the context of Ramadan jihad uh, that Sinwar so much wants, I think that you have really left us with a uh, uh, what what uh, former President Bush uh, uh, said: points of light and uh, and hope uh, that uh, that certainly, hopefully, in the coming weeks, things will pass uh, in Israel uh, uh, with uh, calm. And um, I, I hesitate to use the word peace. We're not in a peaceful environment, but as opposed to the the terrible tragedy continuing with our uh, hostages in Gaza which we hope and pray will, uh, we will define them and, and, and kill their uh, captors. Uh, hopefully Ramadan will pass uh, uh, peacefully this year. Jacques. We say Ramadan Karim. Rad Ramadan Karim. That's right, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you, Khalid. Uh, thanks. I think that we're going to put the exclamation point in the period here. I think we've said it all, uh, and so we'll, we'll uh, leave it there for our viewers and thank our viewers very much uh, for their loyalty and their interest in book. Look forward to another episode of Al Shakar Ausatlana, our Middle East. Thank you.